Good evening, everyone. I am Bandhu Kuruku, Technical Events Coordinator for Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. And this is our 14th session on this lecture series on structural design of highway bridges. And our sincere gratitude to Professor Thisan Singh for conducting this lecture series. And uh, for the participants, kindly add your membership number along with your login name so that ISL can trace your participation. And over to you, sir. Thank you, Vanduka. Right. Today, uh, what I thought was uh, uh, we'll uh, spend a little time on uh, found substructure and the foundations. Okay, so uh, today we see what is the way that bridges are constructed, and uh, this may be true for all types of bridges, not only for the continuous ones. So we'll uh, just think about uh, some important aspects of a bridge. The first thing is the we need an abutment. Now this abutment might have a raft foundation, a raft, or it could be a pile foundation. Now, early days, a lot of engineers like this raft. But nowadays, you know, you can see they are keen on high. So, now in the abutment, this is the abutment wall. And this is called dirt wall. So basically to ensure that, you know, all this soil will not affect the superstructure of the bridge. So when you have a bridge, Banduka, you can hear me properly, I hope. Yeah, yes, sir, we can hear you pro yeah. properly. Okay, okay. Right. So this is the apartment. And here you get a pier. And again, uh, you might have something like that. Then, uh, then we get the beams supported on the pier. And uh, to facilitate this uh, supporting of the beams, we might enlarge the pier like that. And we call it a pier capping beam. Now, this part that is uh, here is called the superstructure. And this part is called substructure. And then if you are going for piling or whatever, that part is called foundation. So that is the usual terminology that we use in bridges. Then when you are selecting a bridge, there are many factors you have to consider. So you might have a river like this. But that is not important for us because what is important is what is going to happen in a thousand year flood? So it's very generally it's very difficult to find what is the actual water level that occurred in a thousand year flood. So, so we might have to ask the people in that area uh, what happened in the say some uh, for example. When we uh, did the first uh, uh, 
crossing at Kaduvela. They have uh, they have looked at the 1947 and uh, they found that you know there was a house with a, at a high elevation. And in 1947 plus, that uh, house uh, is like on a platform, and uh, the water has reached the floor level. So the house is like that. So, so uh, when the Cardwell Bridge was constructed, they consider this 1947 flood as a reference, and then they decided the level that the, they are going to construct the bridge. So likewise, you know, you have to find that information. Then there's a very common mistake in uh, bridges. That is, you know, you have a valley like this and you have water in the middle. And uh, you, we generally tend to underestimate and then we might construct an uh, abutment like that. Another button like that, and maybe two piers. No, we construct the pitch. But what we have to be careful is that sometimes we find that uh, these are very flat rivers. So they they just just tend to move like that, and they often change the path during floods. So it's very important that we take this into account and sometimes, you know, rather than having the uh, abutment here, we might find that, you know, it's better to have the abutment here. And this has happened uh, at few places in Mahavali River. And after constructing, now they have found that they are they need a Bailey Bridge here. Bailey Bridge here. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the bridge behind the apartment has been washed. Away. The bridge behind the uh, apartment has been washed away. So these are some of the important things that we have to look into. And then uh, we'll see what are the different options that are available for foundation. So one of the options could be a pile foundation. Piled foundation. And then if you are going for a pile foundation, we might have to think about the pile capacities. Now, typical pile sizes in Sri Lanka could be 600 millimeters, uh, 750 millimeters, 800 millimeters. 900 millimeters, 1000 millimeters, 1200, 1500, 1800, 2000. And in Sri Lanka, we have piling machines that can do up to 3000 millimeters. So those are, these are like BG38 machines can do even uh, 3,000 millimeters. And uh, so then the, then the other important thing is now, what are the typical capacities of a pile like this? So this can go up to about 2,500 kilometers service, service loads. And seven hundred. this can go up to about uh, close to 3,000. This can be about 3,500. This can be about close to 4,000. This can be about 4,500. 
and this can be about 6,500. This can be about 10,500. This can be about 13,500. This can be about 16,500. And so on. And uh, so you have to see. Now, now it's very useful to know these capacity. These are both power figures. And uh, the important thing is now if you say 1200 millimeter uh, pile, and you found that you know 6500 kilonewton bearing capacity, load carrying capacity is a very comfortable value. Now, you know, then you have to have a strategy. What is the strategy? How to achieve? 6,500 That is the question. How to achieve 6,500 kilos? Now, for this, I would like to tell a small story about the, the, the soil formation in Sri Lanka. Soil formation in Sri Lanka. Sometimes some of you have already heard of this because I have explained it under various lectures and uh, if you look at the soil formation in Sri Lanka, about 200 million years ago, Sri Lanka was not where we are today, it was part of Africa and there was a part of Australia also there and Sri Lanka was part of India. Then it shifted and came back with Sri Lanka also as part of India, hit this, uh, you know, hit the European uh, continent and created the Everest mountain and Austria drifted like that. And uh, during this journey, it actually went through a burning patch, burning patch in in the world. So because of that, all our soil formations, which used to be of metamorphic, were heated up and all the soil became rock. And then we are having tropical climatic conditions. So even India, Australia, Sri Lanka, all these countries, similar situation can be found. And due to weathering over so many years, so what happens is the rain occurs when the when the rock is warm or very heated, and then uh, there can be minor fractures, and this warm rainwater goes through, and it causes weathering of the soil, the rock. So what we often have bedrock, then we have highly fractured bedrock, fractured bedrock, then we have uh, almost fully weathered rock, and then we often have laterite soils. We often have laterite soils. So, when you are looking at uh, all this scenario, now, lateralite soil is a residual soil. And uh, now we are talking about measures. So, the water vapor can be uh, reasonably high in these areas. So, what is lateralite soil? Soil is a soil containing clay plus silt up to about 32. 35%, but it can be low as well. Then rest will be sand and gravel. This is the laterite soil. Sometimes this can go up to about 40 to 40, 45%. Sometimes it can drop to about 15 to 25%. <coughs> so, 
there are two different behaviors for laterite soil. One is when water table is low. When water table is high. So there are two different situations that you can get for laterite soils. So laterite soil is a mix of clay and silt, and generally we say clay and silt together because it's a little difficult to uh, separate clay and silt uh, under normal situations unless you go for laboratory testing. So because of that reason, we consider clay and silt as one uh, single material, but uh, clay is very different to silt. And uh, clay is a material, clay is one that can do cohesion. So when the water table is low, laterite soil behaves more like a sandy soil. When the water table is high, laterite soil behaves more like a clay soil. So we have to always keep this in mind. So if the water table is low, this is a very strong material. And if the water table is high, not so strong, why? It can be subjected to scouring. Scouring, scouring damage is one of the big problems in business because we construct the brick, let's say it's on piles, the piers can be the ones that are severely subjected to scouring. And we have the piers. And uh, sometimes there is evidence to suggest the normal bed might be <coughs> something like this. That is the normal bed of the river. But due to scouring, Sometimes you might find that you know material up to a depth of about eight meters can be removed, exposing the piles and the pile caps. So this is something that we have to be very careful because generally we expect the covering depth to be about two to three meters, but uh, under very severe flood conditions, sometimes this can easily go up to about five to Eight meters, and they say with us sometimes it has gone even up to ten meters. Now, this is something we have to keep in mind when you are doing digits. Because if you forget about scouring, it can end up in a disaster. And there, you know, we have seen so many digits failing, and you might wonder there can be many reasons in Sri Lanka. Uh, the failures can be due to these reasons. Now, let's say we have a bridge like this and uh, supported by the piers. And uh, sometimes, so we use the water levels and normal water levels, but during a flood time, it can be higher. And not only that, this brings floating logs. It can bring in floating logs, and these logs can sometimes hit the bridge and cause severe damage. So we have to be very much concerned about the not only the high flood level. So we have to be concerned about the high flood level, but in addition to that, floating tree trunks. Now that could be a big problem in uh, tropical climatic conditions. So we have to be concerned about that test. So, so basically, there are two problems you have to look for. One is high flood level and floating heavy objects like tree trunks. The other important thing is scour damage. 
So those two must be paid sufficient attention when you are selecting a fault. Then you might ask why they are important. Now let's see. Now we try to do a pile. And the river bed, uh, when we do the investigation, you might find there are some laterite formations. And you might get a lot of sandy deposits. There are some laterite formations. And then uh, you might get uh, completely weathered rocks. Weathered rock. And uh, you might get fractured rock. Fractured rock is the one where the weathering has already started, and then you might get bed. Only cracked, fractured, but you know, they are all as one mass. Now, this lateral formation might be reported as clay soil because the water table is. It might not be reported as a laterite formation, it might be uh, reported as a clay formation. So, where shall we stop the pile formation? It's very important that we go deep into the bedrock. Why? Because of scour damage, one reason. The other one is these also can exert heavy bending moments on the structure. So it's good, it's good to think that you know we have to be very careful in uh, when you are doing a bridge supported by pine formations. The reason is unless you anchor the pies deep into the bedrock. You know, you might uh, end up having some problems. So I can give you some examples of uh, bridges in uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, so, for, for example, uh, in uh, Orugodovat flyover, which is not a bridge, it's a flyover. So we do not have water, but, uh, you know, we had some uh, reasonable soil conditions. And some piles went to 30 to 38 meters. And we actually uh, did socketing. Uh, there were many fractured layers and uh, weathered layers. But we, 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 we uh, did rock socketing, I think, uh, equal 1.2 meters or more. Uh, we did rock socketing. But if you look at Kenya Bridge, Look at uh, Kenya Bridge. The original suggestion was seven meters of socketing, which uh, it was actually too much, and uh, the rock was exposed. So finally, uh, you know, it was settled that about four meters of. And you might ask why form. So the important thing is, you know, now the, here the good rock was exposed. That is also a very dangerous situation. Why? Because the, you have the rock exposed. And you need to have the beach with clearance. So we need to have a foundation. Right? Rock is uh, pretty close or it almost exposed, very short pipes. Then you go deeper into the rock. Why? It's a short pipe. Why do you go so deep into four meters depth into the rock? So I would say short piles are very dangerous piles. Why? Because when you have a pile, might you might have very weak soils that you tend to ignore then generally you might get uh, in greater than 15 type uh, soils 
and if the soil has a uh, spt value greater than 15 then we consider that as a good soil uh, where the skin friction can be mobilized. If the skin friction can be, if, if any, uh, if the SPT value after all the corrections is less than 15, we generally tend to ignore that type of size when you are dealing, when you are calculating the pile capacity. And then you might have some good size and then with that size where the end is coming to about 30 to 35. And then you might get uh, uh, you know, completely weathered rock. Weathered rock, but very strong. N can be 50 or more. And then after that, you know, there's no point in talking about SPT value because you are going to go into a fractured rock. And real uh, basement rock. Now, in pile foundations for bridges, it is advisable to go into this. And you can have some end bearing. I'm using the word some end bearing. And then we also have a good deal of skin friction in both these situations. Both uh, fracture rock and basement rock, you can have pretty good skin friction. And after that, you know, because <coughs> depending on the soil layers, you can also think about some skin friction in these layers. Up to here, you might consider that they can be some skin friction. And if SPD is less than 5, we might even consider negative <coughs> skin friction. Not always, but uh, you, and under certain situations, uh, especially if you are going to have any kind of fill, you might have to consider negative skin friction as well. So now we look at short pile versus long pile. Short pile versus long pile. Short pile. Short pile is a long pile. So what are chances? It may have few soil layers in greater than 15. After that, bit drop. And you go for the normal, typical anchor socketing into the bedrock one times diameter or at least one meter. Minimum one meter, but generally preferably one times diameter. Now, this is a very dangerous pile and it might fail as well. Why? Because here you can see we are having good rock. When I say good rock, I would say core recovery is close to 100%. And I would say RQD is about 70 to 80%. And I hope you know what is RQD. You take a core and it can be fractured. And you take all the pieces that are longer than 100 millimeters and keep them all together. Uh, over, you take a core of one meter and uh, separate all the uh, big pieces that are longer than 100 millimeters and then keep them all together. And uh, the original length is one meter versus the length of these long pieces, say 70 centimeters, then RQD is 70. So that's how you get the RQD, and RQD is a good indication of uh, how, how much it is recovered, fractured. So this is a good indication how much it is fractured. Core recovery is a good indication of formation of weak layers 
they can be weak layers. And if there are weak layers, then your front board coverage is not very good. Because there are so many weak layers, there are some rock and then weak layer, rock, weak layer, rock, weak layer. Then you'll find that you know the core recovery can drop to about uh, 50, 40, 50 percent. Means you know there are a lot of layers of uh, a lot of weak layers in the middle of good layers. On the other hand, so sorry, so we will finish it off now here. You know, if you think that is a good rock, the geotechnical engineer might say five newtons per millimeter squared. He might come up with some value. But what is the problem? Problem is how well you have cleaned the toe. Toe cleaning is very important. Why? Otherwise, you might have a concrete that fills up this pore like this. So some places is stuck in the toe, but some other places is, is sitting on sand. And you'll find although you have a good rock, rock is not getting the full load. So in a, such a situation, the pile is actually held by the skin friction in the rock. And the only safeguard that we have is this good skin friction and a little bit of skin friction on the soil. So if we don't do the environment properly by removing all the sand that would have been accumulated, that would have accumulated uh, in various reasons by by using a bentonite slurry, we keep on pumping and uh, do a toe flushing. If you don't do it properly, then short pile might settle. Why? It's so easy to overcome the skin friction. Then when you are, when you are talking about skin friction, we have to look at some typical values. So I'll use a long pile for that purpose. So we might have a completely weathered rock. When is greater than 50. And then you might have a fractured rock. And you have basement rock. So if you look at ICTAD guidelines, ICTAD guidelines have been has been very careful, very conservative. They might give 100. 120 to 150, yeah. and this you, know, you might get 50 because uh, generally we say SPT, uh, or you might get about 40 because we say in the ICTAD guideline it says uh, skin friction is 0.65 times with a factor of safety of 2. So this is a service value. So if you have all these values, they are very conservative, and you have a deep pile, pile is deep or long, and there are good soil layers in greater than two, right? And then we come to the weather rock, completely weathered, fractured, and then we go into uh, the basement. Now what happens? Now what happens? Now what happens is, you know, all these areas we have skin friction. And even if the toe has a little problem, there's a high chance that this pile might hold because this is going to be about actually about 352. 500 kilonewtons per meter squared under service, and these are real measured values. Though the though the ICTAD guideline says is 200, and don't use anything more than 200. There's some recent uh, testing done on Central Expressway Stage One, which we have actually stopped at the moment uh, due to lack of funding. 
they have found that you know the 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 skin friction values can be as high as 350 500 in fracture drop it can be about 250 to 350 and on weather drop uh, you know you can use this uh, value sometimes skin friction as equal to n is also maybe accurate because sometimes when you when you look at the skin friction values especially in uh, soils like laterite soils <coughs> n equals points sorry skin friction equals 0.65 times n could be considered only thing is you know we are doing we have to follow the guidelines of uh, our own country so you might use these uh, values given in the required specifications but you might find they are very consistent. So, uh, so if you look at a long pile and we have some fracture drop of fracture drop of say two to three meters, and if you do about two meters of socketing, what will happen? These uh, two meters can develop huge amount of skin friction and this also can generate a lot of skin friction. So even without much support from the toe, you might find the pile is, uh, pile is very stiff. What is the reason? Because, you know, we have underestimated the skin friction the actual skin friction. So we use values like 100 to 150. Actual can be 250 to 350. And then uh, in the proper rock, we, we consider up to 200 kilonewtons per meter squared. The actual values can vary between 350 to 500 kilonewtons per meter. So one thing is, you know, our piles may not be very optimum when you, know, when you follow all these guidelines, but the chances for failure chances of failure is very remote. Unless you have done a plan. And uh, especially in highway bridges, it might be a good idea to go for about two meters of top splitting. Uh, then you might ask why I make this suggestion. Because, you know, when a foundation fails in a bridge, it's very difficult to correct it. So that is one reason. Secondly, uh, when we go for something like two meters of top splitting, because we are using bentonite, you know, we cannot do any physical inspection of the top. So basically we are relying on experience. So because of that reason, I actually prefer special for builders because we are really not sure of the loading conditions and all the other covering effects, uh, foundation, uh, you know, various kinds of loads that might come during the construction. We really don't know much about all those uh, factors because of that reason. And also, above all, the possibility for covering. Uh, I would suggest that, you know, we can have a norm of about two meters of socketing because in Sri Lanka now these days we have BT 24, 28, 30, and sometimes very high top machines like 38. So basically, uh, breaking into the rock with the kind of piling machines we have is not difficult. Not difficult. Because our rock is very good, but not super hard. So it's not extremely hard, but it's a very good rock, but not extremely. So because of that reason, 
these good Brigaman machines, where we have plenty in Sri Lanka, can easily go uh, about two meters into the rock, easy. And the moment you have this kind of situation, like two meters or something, the advantage is that even if there is some weakness in the toe area, still the pile is going to hold proper. It's not going to show any kind of weakness. So that is one thing that we can be sure of. And the other thing that you can do is, because if you want to really optimize the pile design, If you really want to optimize the pile design, what you do is you will go for something like three meters of subtlety and use a skin friction like uh, 350 to 400 kilonewtons per meter square and Assume a reasonable invariant because now you are doing about three meters of socket in this. You can easily assume five newtons per million square in bearing. And then pile shaft also you will lose 40 megapascal or 50 megapascal concrete. And here I'm talking about cube strength. Rather than using 30 megapascal. Rather than using 30 megapascal concrete, you would consider cube strength of 40 to 50 megapascal, which will give a shaft strength of 0.25 times 40 or 10 newtons per millimeter squared. So if you are using an in bearing of 5 newtons per meter squared, you can get another. 5 newtons per 5 forms skin friction and end bearing because the shaft capacity is about 10. If you are going for 5 newtons per millimeter squared end bearing, you can easily get another 5 from skin friction. So, which means you are you can go. You can stretch it up to the shaft capacity of the pipe. So if you have 1.2 diameter pipes, in Euro code, when you are considering the area, it, uh, it asks you to make some allowance. Let's say something like 100 millimeter reduction in the, in the size of the pile. So uh, we might get Phi into 1100 square divided by 4 multiplied by 10 as the shaft capacity, and the shaft capacity will be uh, 3.14 into 1100 square divided by 4 multiplied by 10. So you can see uh, 1200 phi can take something like 9400. 98 kilonewtons and if you want even further to stretch it even further you might consider uh, something like 50 megapascal concrete and that can give something like 11,800 kilonewtons so you can see we can stretch the capacity if we want, but make sure when you are stretching like this by using high, higher strength concrete for the shaft, you must make sure that the socketing is not limited to one times diameter or something like that. You will be generous in the socketing because things can go drastically wrong with this type of pile capacities. If you don't do the socketing properly and also don't do the uh, toe, clear, toe cleaning properly. So 
So, so you have to be very careful when you are going for high capacity piles. And the best way out of a high capacity pile is socketing at least about three meters uh, so that the skin friction will hold it proper. So actually the values can be even as high as 500. And if you are having uh, uh, something like uh, three meters of socketing with an additional one meter of socketing in the fractured rock, uh, a total of four meters of socketing because these uh, new machines can easily break into the fractured rock. Uh, effortlessly they can go through fractured rock, whereas uh, they will struggle a little with extremely good quality rock. But uh, so let's say we have four meters of socketing and we are ha having an average skin friction of uh, 400. So we have, we, what we have is pi d, 3.14 into uh, diameter. Uh, diameter is uh, 1.2 in the uh, perimeter multiplied by 4, multiplied by 400. There you can see the skin friction alone can be something like 6,000 kilometers. 6,000 kilometers. Now you can see the trick is not to have a typical value called one times diameter socketing subjected to a minimum of one meter, but to look at this situation logically and then understand that, you know, if you want, you can have typical value like 1,200 uh, millimeter pile, a typical value like 6,500 kilonewtons. On the other hand, the same 1,200 millimeter pile, and this might be possible with 30 megapascal concrete, and with 40 to 50 megapascal concrete, you might reach something like 9,500 kilonewtons, or even going up to about 11,800 kilonewtons with 50 megapascal. And this is with 40 megapascal. And the moment you are going into these ranges, you are stretching the capacity of the pile. That means you have to accompany that by rock of three to four meters. So if you want to have high capacity piles, because you know the bridge has uh, have, there are some restrictions on the diameter of the uh, piles that you can use because uh, they can be restrictions on the uh, especially when you are constructing roads uh, elevated roads on the existing highways you might find that your foundations have to be restricted foundations have to be restricted so, generally, we prefer to have a rule like 2.5 times to 3 times diameters as the spacing of the pipes. So, when you have two pipes adjacent, I mean, we like to have at least 2.5 times diameter separation. So, if you go for a large pile, there are four piles, then you will find that the foundation can become pretty large and uh, you know you might have some problems because you are already constructing an elevated highway on a road where the traffic is already using the road so you know you cannot have uh, wide foundations you have to have very narrow foundations so under such situations you will find uh, you cannot achieve the, the or you cannot satisfy the requirements by going for typical pile designs and getting something like getting 1200 millimeter piles carrying 6500 is not going to solve the problem but you might need innovative designs where 1200 pile 
can carry 11,800 kilonewtons and you might find now because it has so much capacity, no need to go for 1,200. You might find that even 900 can work, right? And when you have 900, what happens is the distance between the two consecutive piles can be reduced to about 2.4. So you can see significant saving can be made, but all these are possible provided that you are going for uh, 40 to 50 megapascal concrete for the pile. And also uh, you are going for three to four meters of toxin. Uh, Bandhu, is it clear? The argument? Yes, sir. That's clear. It's clear, right? So, so basically, now time has come for us to uh, break away from the tradition of using uh, 30 megapascal concrete. So, we, we, are, we were happy with 30 megapascal concrete for files. But time has come for us to break away from that. That's one. And then uh, there's another important thing we have to be concerned. <clears throat> that is, you know, uh, the reinforcement in a pipe. So how much reinforcement that we provide? So for that, we have to first understand what is a pipe. A pipe is supposed to be carrying a fairly high axial load. Uh, like, you know, uh, having given rise to a stress of, of about 6 to 10 newtons per millimeter square on the shaft. And it might be subjected to some bending moment. But generally, the bending moment on the pile is restricted to 3 to 4 meters up from the top of the pile. After that, you know, very, very rarely you get any significant bending moment on the pile. So in that situation, you will definitely need some reinforcement uh, in the top part of the pipe. There's no question. But the, but the other important situation is, what, what I'm going to do as it goes deep into it, and then go into the side. So there are two. Uh, schools of thought. One is if the pile is subjected to a bending moment only in the first three to four meters, then this is going to be a axially loaded member having about six to ten newtons per millimeter squared axial stress. Even without any reinforcement, this can be a very strong, very strong in resisting bending moments. Why? Because it's like a pre-stress concrete member. Because it's a member subjected to a high axial stress. So it's like a pre-stress concrete member. So it's very strong in resisting bending. So theoretically, you don't need reinforcement after a certain length, like uh, 12 meters. Theoretically, you don't need. And uh, even 9 meters might do, but uh, you can have, say, something like 9 to 12 meters of reinforcement. After that, even without any reinforcement, the pile can be a very safe Why? It is subjected to a pre-compression. Any member subjected to pre-compression is, is like a pre-stress concrete member. And we all know pre-stress concrete members, we use steel to do the pre-compression. And if we give a pre-compression, even with many any other means, then what happens is due to the pre-compression, the member will behave as a very strong element. But uh, 
in uh, so this is very strong under static conditions but uh, if it is subject to the dynamic conditions like earthquake then it is prudent to have some reinforcement unit so because of that reason um, if you look at euro code uh, euro codes allow us to have about 0.5% uh, reinforcement in a pile because pile is a lightly loaded lightly loaded column pile is a lightly loaded column why because it has a sharp strength of about 30 to 40 but the stresses are only in the range of 6 newtons per minute so uh, cube strength of 30 means actual strength of 24 Actual strength is 24, but the stress is only 6 or 7. So, it is a very safe, lightly loaded member. So, so, when we consider all these, when we take all these into account in a bridge, you might find that when you are providing the reinforcement, if we provide about 0.8%, at the top part and reduce it to about 0.5 percent at the bottom part it would be it would have a perfect have a perfect even under earthquake so it might be a good idea to have some reinforcement going up to the bedrock because in a scour situation sometimes this reinforcement might be pretty useful. So, because of that reason, in bridge foundations, so we can say you know about 0.8 percent reinforcement at the top and 0.5 percent reinforcement at the bottom might be a good idea. But now these are all uh, static conditions. But considering some dynamic effects, we have considered this. But the important thing is we are going to have a pile cap and the pile. And the here, something like that. Now these are pipe, and it is going. It has gone into the bedrock. It's anchored. All that is there. So this is going to be like a cantilever, and it's connected to the pipe cap. And it's a good idea to have closely spaced spiders at the top one to one point five meters. You you have to ask why. Either is you take a concrete cube. Test it, it will go like that. Now you take the concrete cube, you apply stressors in compression on all directions and test it vertically in compression, going to have bigger curves depending on the confinement. And the area on the curve like this is the work needed and uh, before the concrete crushes, it will show a huge strength when the confinement is when the confinement is. So here what we are trying to say is we'll use a spiral at 100 millimeter centers at the top part of the pile where the plastic hinges can form. In an earth, in an earthquake, plastic hinges might form at the top of the bridge. So because of that, it's better to enhance the confinement. And the moment you enhance the confinement, concrete will be pretty strong. And you will find the earthquake induced forces cannot damage the uh, 
while because bridges are caused disaster structures so because bridges are caused disaster structures we will take certain precautions especially under earthquake situations and one is close the space spiral at the top and then having about 0.8% reinforcement of 0.8 to 1% reinforcement at the top and continuing to the bottom of which has 0.5% reinforcement and even without reinforcement we will be very safe but uh, we don't want to take a risk because uh, when you take the overall cost of the bridge and providing 0.5% reinforcement in the in the pile the saving would be very minute so because of that reason uh, we might consider that it's a good idea to uh, go for uh, some reinforcement until the bottom and the most important thing is a closely spaced spiral here and after that it can be a pitch of 150 to 200 depending on the piling contractor's need like uh, the piling contractor will need certain stiffness for the piling cage or the reinforcement cage and uh, for that stiffness you might have to uh, they might need a certain spacing but certainly at the top of the pile, pile uh, it's good to have a spiral uh, closely linked so that the circular uh, spiral, this uh, spiral can provide a plenty of confinement to concrete so that concrete will behave like a super strong material, not 30 metaphors concrete and that will prevent crushing of uh, concrete in the pile at the top and the bridge might be able to survive the earthquake pretty well. So, so when you are looking at piles, uh, you have to actually be a little careful and then you might ask uh, what, what we have done in some of the bridges at Orgodwatha flyover uh, you know the original design by RTA I think had about 10 piles or 12 piles and we actually used slightly larger piles and made it reduced to four numbers of uh, 1200 millimeter piles and we replace about 5 to uh, 10 to 12 1 diameter by 1 meter diameter piles 1.0 meter diameter piles by using only four numbers of 1200 millimeter piles and uh, we went for a capacity of 6500 kilonewtons service then I can tell you another example from a building, and that is the example of Altea, which is a twin large craft, one building going like that, twin towers. And in this particular building, uh, the soil was severely fractured, the rock was severely fractured. And bedrock could not be reached because it was fractured to a great huge depth. So the only option we had was to go for friction piles anchored 10 meters into highly fractured rock. Highly fractured rock. And now you can see. We are creating, we are going, a large number of piles are going about 10 meters into the highly fractured rock. And each pile we are pumping concrete. So, what will happen? All this uh, drought will leak and it might start repairing the fractures. So, again, uh, 60 megapascal. Uh, concrete was used in uh, piles and the capacities were 1200 millimeters 
expectation was 11,700 kilometers and 1,500 pies. Generally, the capacity is about 10,500. Here, the expectation was 17,000. And how did we assure that? Uh, so, we actually got, went for maintained load testing, not PDA loan. PDA was performed on many, but we did MLT on test pipes. And we assured that huge capacity can be reached because, uh, you know, it taxes 200 skin friction. Now, with these very low values like 200 kilonewtons per meter square, the building would have become very uneconomical because uh, we would have needed a huge diameter pipe. So instead of using these very low values, knowing that the actual skin friction can be about 350 to 500 kilonewtons per meter squared, we actually uh, uh, relied on the pile testing than uh, the calculated values. So we actually relied a lot on the pile test data than the uh, values that we predict by using conservative values like 200 kilometers per so so that is something that <coughs> that you can you also can use as uh, bridge engineers and uh, you know if you can do a test file at a particular site and also when you are doing a test file uh, you have to make sure that uh, you know, you are stretching it beyond a certain limit. And when you are stretching, it's a always good practice to make sure you rely a lot on skin friction offered by the rock. Rock can offer a very high skin friction. So mobilize it. Uh, it might cost you little money to break into the rock. About two, three to three, to, about two, two point five to three meters or three to four meters. It might cost you a little money, but when you consider the overall benefit, it can be huge. So you can see, you know, these days we are talking again, talking about light rail transit and all that. And uh, if it had some conventional designs where the pile piles have been designed in the conventional way. Now, uh, it might be a good idea to optimize it so that, uh, you know, we can save a lot of money and also uh, make the structures lean uh, by stretching the materials to a greater level because, uh, you know, if you are using Euro ports, uh, that possibility is readily given. So, because of that reason, I would recommend that uh, in future projects, uh, when you are involved, always don't look at file design in the traditional way. Always think about it logically and also with, uh, with uh, some degree of innovation, then uh, you will find that uh, you can get, uh, finally end up getting a very economical structures. So then you might ask, uh, now how do you ensure a good, you know, very high strength like uh, uh, 40 to 50 megapascal in a pipe? 40 to 50 megapascal in a pipe because we can't see it. So we are talking about 40 to 50 megapascal uh, concrete. And uh, how can we make sure we achieve it? Uh, definitely within the pipe. So the trick comes if you are looking for 40 to 50 megapascal concrete, uh, say 50 megapascal concrete. So let's say we are, we are looking for something like 50 megapascal concrete. Uh, 
நான் மிகச்சரி பாருங்க சோ இஃப் யூ ஆர் லுக்கிங் ஃபார் சம்திங் லைக் 50 மெகா பாஸ்கல் கம்ப்ளீட் we can actually start using about 375 kg of portland cement and we can use about 125 kg of fly ash which will give us 500 kg of cementitious material and on this side you get uh, sand and aggregate and water and wet density of about 2470 so you get on this side you get 2470 and uh, water of about 150 using a good admixture like supercrete or adcrete uh and then on this side you get 500 kg and plus sand plus four aggregate and we can also because we are just dropping the concrete in a large uh, pour we can use the uh, coarse to sand ratio of about uh, 1.6 to 1.7 let's assume we are using 1.7 so uh, then uh, <clears throat> s plus 1.7 s is c is 1.7 times s is equal to 2470 minus 500 minus 150 and so s will be 2470 minus 500 minus minus 150 uh, divided by 2.7 675 kilograms of sand and uh, 2470 minus 500 minus 150 minus 675 will give us uh, force Content as one one forty five kilograms per meter cube. So what will happen is when you have all these numbers. Now we are look at what is the effect of this fly ash. So if you have five hundred kilograms of cement, you might get a curve like that, and definitely it will be more than. within 5 uh, to 6 days 6 to 7 days you will find it is it is about 55 60 mega pascal because we have used that mixtures but uh, the the real concrete that you are using will take a different path it go like this but it will continue to rise like that so what you find is that using fly ash with about going up to about 25% you can limit the cement content to about 375 kg per meter cube where the cost of cement can be close to 50 kg per 50 rupees per kg or 45 rupees per kg and then you use 125 kg of fly ash where the 1 kg can cost only about 10 15 rupees and uh, because fly ash is available and pile is under the soil no disturbance no 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 heating up difficult for water to escape so because of that you are definitely going to have a Uh, strain development up to about one to two years, you will get a significant strain development. So, with all that, you can assure that the uh, capacity of the uh, pile will be very good, and the pile shaft 
is uh, it can easily reach 40 megapascal or 50 megapascal. And in doing so, you are, you are going to have three to four meters of suffering. And with that, you are going to say the pile capacity is like uh, 1,200 piles carrying about 10,000 kilonewtons or 1,500 uh, ones carrying about 15,000 uh, kilonewtons. So those are the values you can think about. So you can see these are completely a, a different way of thinking about uh, piling because uh, we are relying a lot on the skin fiction within the fracture rock and the basement rock to have enhanced capacity for piles so that we can actually save a lot of money. And also in modern construction of bridges, often you will find that you know we are actually upgrading the existing roads. In such situations, you will find that uh, going for high strength concrete with uh, greater socketing and high capacity piles with small diameters. So, so which will allow us to have piles at a closer spacing and uh, allow us to give good solutions for restricted sites. So this is, these are some of the things, the new way of thinking that you have to develop gradually because, uh, you know, as structural bridge engineers, uh, you know, you cannot uh, always rely on uh, uh, the geotechnical engineer. So you have to first come up with a solution uh, on, based on concrete technology, and then piling, and then once you have all that, you can always consult a good geotechnical engineer and get a detailed set of calculations done uh, by the geotechnical engineer, highlighting uh, the, the, you know, taking the real soil parameters into account, which often the structural engineers or big engineers find it difficult. And then you can also rely on test files to verify the facts, the, the various values that you have designed, uh, that you have used, like, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, skin friction of 350 to 500 kilonewtons per meter squared uh, within the bedrock or the fracture rock. So you can use those high values, come up with the design, and then get a test file done. So once you do get all that sorted out, you will find that you can come up with uh, very efficient designs that are going to cost much lower. The moment you bring in a fly ash based concrete technology also, also into the project. So that's the way you can actually look at five foundations. And uh, uh, what I presented is something uh, like, you know, how to stretch the limits on uh, pile capacities. And especially, uh, you know, considering some of the provisions that are given in uh, Europe, like, you know, using uh, a reinforcement ratio of only about 0.5% considering the fact that piles are only lightly loaded uh, columns. So those are the important things uh, that we discussed today. So with uh, that, uh, Bang, uh, uh, do you have, you have any questions? Uh, that's yeah, one question. You, know, you consider only the vertical load, but in big structures, you have horizontal loads uh, from breaking loads and earth pressure. On a, but, but what you have to understand is, uh, all these loads, the breaking loads, all those loads are actually uh, can cause bending moment on a member that is subjected to high compression. So, so if you think you know you cannot manage it two piles, the moment you go go with four piles, all these breaking loads will be converted to no, they will not act like a bending moment. So what actually happens is when you are when you, if you are using four piles like this, 
So all these breaking loads that will cause a bending moment will be uh, tension and compression on this side. So basically, uh, uh, so although you think they, they can be critical, but uh, the moment you go with four piles, you will find that you know all these bending moments will be converted to a tension on one pile, compression on the other pile. But what you have to understand is this the actual compression on these piles will be much higher than what you get as breaking loads. So because of that reason, uh, the, the, the breaking load will become a problem only if you are going to have the peer supported by two piles. But if you are going to have, have it supported by four piles, then it's a very, uh, it will become all these moments will become fairly insignificant. So that is one. Secondly, what you have to understand is even if you have only two piles, pile is a vertically loaded member having a stress of about, about uh, uh, due to the dead load alone, it might have a stress of about five newtons per meter square. The moment the stress is high, the pile becomes extremely strong. So that's why you know it's good to go for something like. 40 megapascal concrete, go for higher stresses on the shaft. Because those are axial stresses, it is axially loaded member. Having a stress, even due to the dead weight, you might find the stresses can be about five to six newtons per meter squared. Then you will find when the, you know, all these breaking loads will come when the full live loads are available. So with the live load, the stresses can be about eight to nine newtons per meter squared. And then when you apply the breaking loads, you find the effect of moments could be extremely low. And even those moments would be confined mainly to the, uh, uh, sometimes uh, they can come to the lower level, but uh, because the pile is buried in soil, uh, you know, if you put some spring sand, I will show you how to do the modeling. Uh, if you actually put some springs and uh, look at the actual scenario by modeling the soil, then you will find that these moments are not very significant. So that's the way you have to look at it. But only thing is, you know, you have to be concerned about this cover damage as well. Because, you know, if you look at some of these breaking loads, they are the total magnitude may be about 400, 500 kilonewtons. So that is well, even 500 kilonewtons is 50 tons. So that's a 50 ton load acting horizontally in the deck. And uh, the other important thing is, especially if you are having some kind of continuous structures, all these breaking loads will be shared not by one pile or one peer, it will be shared by a number of peers. So due to that also, you will find that these breaking loads are not very significant in a bridge structure. And uh, the always you have to keep in mind, pile is a is going to behave like a pre-stressed concrete member, provided that we have got all our the eccentricities, all those things sorted out, so that pile is primarily an axially loaded. Banduka, is it clear? I mean, is it a good answer? Yes, sir. That explained it. Uh, I think. Yeah, yeah. So. So I think we are coming closer to 8.30, is that right? Yes, sir. So we Six. can actually uh, wind up. Uh, if there are any other questions, they can quickly put it on the chat. Otherwise, we can wind up. And we, we can continue the same thing next uh, one also, because I can show you uh, how we can put the springs and model the so soil and all those things I can show you. I can show you how to do the computer modeling of um, bridges uh, by uh, showing how these uh, spring constants can be derived and all that. So that we can discuss next time. Okay, sir. And uh, I would like to invite uh, engineer Karthikeyan to do the word of thank. Dear all, it is my honor to deliver a vote of thanks on behalf of the organizing committee for this webinar on the structural design of highway bridges. 
First and foremost, I would like to express our utmost gratitude to the distinguished speaker of this lecture series, Professor Tisan J. Singh. Your remarkable expertise and profound knowledge have greatly enriched our understanding of this complex field. Your captivating presentation has inspired us all and we genuinely thankful for the invaluable insights you have shared. Our sincere thanks also go to engineer Mrs. Kamala Gunabarthane, the esteemed chairman of the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee and the entire team of dedicated organizers who have worked tirelessly to bring this webinar to fruition. Your unwavering commitment and relentless efforts in organizing this event have not gone unnoticed and we extend our appreciation, appreciation for your dedication. Furthermore, we would like to express our profound gratitude to the IESL Secretariat, IESL Public Publicity Department, and the IT team of IESL for their exceptional hosting arrangements. The seamless technical support and impeccable assistance provided by your team have been pivotal in ensuring the success of this webinar. Your unwavering commitment to the excellence is truly commendable and we are sincerely grateful for your invaluable contributions. Last but certainly not least, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to all the participants who have graced us with their presence and active engagement. In conclusion, I trust that this webinar has been an enlightening and enriching experience for all. We remain grateful for the privilege of hosting such an esteemed gathering of professionals. We eagerly anticipate your presence at our next session scheduled for the upcoming Tuesday. Once again, I express my deepest gratitude to everyone involved. Thank you. And may you all have a restful and peaceful night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.